Welcome back to another episode of Professionals Podcasting. This is another in the series of Flying Solo with Attorney Bernie, where Attorney Bernie discusses the brain with Gary Howard and Matthew Kayser. What do we know about the brain? How does it work uh, at a, a cellular level, molecular level? Uh, what we don't know about the brain? And mo- and how do are people modeling the brain right now? Where we are in modeling the brain? Uh uh, how this cor- correlates to computer models. And lastly, we're going to be talking about organoids. Now, when I saw that on the uh, list of topics, I was intrigued and I'm worried that we don't going to have enough time to get there. So why don't we just start that start there first? Of course. <laughs> so um, what's now being done in uh, many laboratories around the world is that scientists are being able to take um, stem cells or cells from somebody's body and tune them up to you treat them with different um, chemicals and um, molecules and growth factors, and uh, they turn into a, a generalized um, what's called a, a, a tot- pluripotent stem cell, um, and that can be changed into any particular type of tissue. And so what they're doing now is they're taking those type of stem cells and they're able to grow them in a three-dimensional pattern um, uh, structure um, and the cells just divide and then they form connections with each other um, and they're essentially forming um, a smaller organ version of what the cell um, um, cell type is for example you can do um, make muscle cells into muscle organoids um, and heart heart cells into heart organoids and in this case, we can make um, neur- neural cells, neurons, and um, other um, brain cells into small mini brains. And what's the practical application of that, Matthew? You can by that way you can then study how the cells interact with each other, and we'll be actually be able to understand how the cells communicate with each other on a, a larger structural basis. So, for example, these um, organoids, you know, can be a, a, a sort of a, a small bundle of cells of, of s- several thousand cells um, in number, um, and they essentially sort of can communicate with each other. And so that way, we'll be able to understand a little bit more about how, for example, as we're going to talk about it later on, how brain cells um, operate. The very okay. thing, the very one very interesting piece of research has come out recently um, in the within the last year, is that people have been able to grow organoids, brain organoids, from both chimpanzee um, stem cells as well as human stem cells and it's interesting that when you grow these uh, organoids up the human stem cells always grow into an organoid that's about twice as big as the chimpanzee one so it um and we know that you know from our obvious studies that our brains are two to three times larger than those of chimpanzees mm-hmm. and so there is something in the in the this difference between human cells and the chimpanzee cells which is um, dictating that the brain c- the cells uh, grow more often or, or more rep- repeatedly. And some people have now found that there's a particular gene which, um, when it's switched on in humans, it's a, the human version, it actually causes the neurons, uh, the, the pr- precursor brain cells, to divide two more times. And so your starting material is is three to four times more cells than you would have right. um, than otherwise. So that's how you oh. end up with a larger brain. Well, it seems that we're getting ahead of ourselves here. So, Gary, <laughs> why don't you just cover uh, what do we know about the brain right now? How does it work and what don't we know? <laughs> we'll just cover that. And then we can talk about the modeling and the computer. Yeah. Models. <clears throat> Glad to do that. Uh, you know, the brain and how the brain works is really, I think, one of the last major problems in biology you know, uh, gene regulation, how genes turn on and turn off is pretty well understood these days and a lot of developments understood, but how the brain functions is one of the last great problems. So I do know a lot about it. I mean, clearly it's a physical entity and it depends on a lot of chemicals as well. And we know that because injuries to the brain uh, destroy the ability of people to undertake certain functions. Like we know that a stroke or physical damage on the left side of the brain often uh, interferes with people's ability to speak. 
We know that drugs taken uh, therapeutically can help with various kinds of mental illnesses and so forth. So we know that there's a real interplay between phys the physical side and the chemical side, influencing how we think and behave and so forth. We know a lot about that from the molecular end, really. We know, we know that a particular kind of cell called neurons are one of the major players in the neural system. There's a lot of them. There's nearly 100 billion of them in our normal brain, and they are connected with each other and with muscles. And we understand how the electrical impulses that are related to thoughts and actions are transmitted along the nerves and transmitted from nerve to nerve and from nerves to muscle. We understand the little chemical interchanges called synapses or neuromuscular junctions. We pretty much got all that down. That's uh, fairly well understood. So Gary, where well, do we go from here? You know, what don't we know? What we don't know though is, <laughs> if you remember in DNA, there's a series of four chemicals with the names A, T, G, and C, and they're in a long sequence and they encode the proteins that make us up. Right now, all of these billions of neurons in our brain make connections with each other from a few to thousands of connections with each neuron. So the number, the number of connections between them is vast. And what we don't know is how memories are encoded in those connections. So can you explain, can you, sorry, can you explain to us, um, non-scientists, what, what do you mean by encoding, number one? And number two, why do these, why are these connections made? How does it originate? Is it like somebody makes a phone call and somebody picks up on the other <laughs> side? Well, it's a little bit like that. I mean, it is an electrical <laughs> and uh, biochemical <laughs> connection. <laughs> Um, but the coding part is, you know, if we use the, the word brain, B-R-A-I-N, we know that those letters put together encode the word brain, and we recognize that as the organ in our head that mm -hmm. allows us to think and act. What we don't know is how those neurons that are making all these connections to their neighbors how those encode memories. We know the memories are in there. If the connections are broken, the memories are lost, but we don't know what it means. Do you need to have a hundred connections from neuron A to neuron B and another 50 to neuron C to remember that the cat is spelled C-A-T? We don't understand that. And so that is the huge problem right now that is uh, it is bugging us with this. I think at the cellular and molecular level, we have a fairly good understanding of at that very small level. And then there's a lot of work with imaging, looking at areas of the brain that are turned on or turned off in terms of do they use a lot more energy with a particular activity or uh, but those lack right now the resolution to be able to assign them to specific neurons. So that encoding mm -hmm. process is just beyond us right now. So that's okay. where we are trying to now trying to uh, model that. Thank you, Gary. So, uh, Matthew, when we're talking about modeling the brain, um, we, we, we're modeling the brain already but we don't have a total understanding of how these connections are made and how, uh, in terms of uh, cr creating memories. So could you just run through um, what are we doing right now in terms of the knowledge we have and what are the dangers? What, what are the positives and what are the negatives? Well, I think um, one way um, that we understand now is, is, as Gary was alluding to, is how, how uh, a memory is formed physically within a neuron. But um, what we want to try and do is try and find out um, um, how, the, how the memory is actually formed in our brain. And we know that um, when you experience something, uh, your senses experience something, those um, um, actually end up as 
um, new new growth neurons. The the, mm -hmm. the neurons will grow and divide, and then form a particular structure. And that sort of structure of of the interconnection between different brain cells, um, as well as other cells which are called glial cells, um, which actually form supporting structures, um, and they support and both support and also chemically maintain uh, the neurons. Um, there's all this sort of mass of different types of structural um, matter. And so when you come across the same experience again, um, this immediately lights up the same type of, uh, the same group of neurons. So Is that, that how dating um, apps work? Hmm? Is that how dating apps work? Um, I think we, oh, Gary will talk, talk about it a little bit ah. later on, I think. <laughs> okay. um, but but this is how um, a memory is formed and how you recognize something um, when you come across it again. And mm. this is what we're trying to find out. We're trying to understand how those actually happen. And the organoids, I think, will be able to do this because the, the nerve cells in the organoids are actually build themselves up into um, uh, structures that uh, um, that have a sort of a second order um, structure, and they actually do communicate with each other um, in a particular pattern. And so um, we want to try and find out how that happens. All right. Gary, as well, far as as far as practical applications right now, what are the positives and the negatives? Well, public. I think, you know, you know, when we're talking about modeling the brain, you know, you're talking about trying to figure out how to predict what people will do. I mean, that's one practical application mm. is that people look for that. And, you know, so we can look at it, you know, on the on the, uh, the smallest structural levels of the cells and the molecules and so forth. And you can also start modeling it from larger imaging and looking at from both ends. But there are some people out there that, as Matthew or you alluded to just a moment ago, who are already trying to make predictions about the way we think. Dating apps clearly do that. And so they're taking information about us, about our behavior, and trying to look at all of those and trying to match us with another person. Or advertisers are looking at your behaviors and trying to predict your, your other future behaviors. And the scientists are also doing very similar things, I think, by looking at which parts of the brains turn on and off uh, and with various thoughts and actions and so forth, as Matt was just saying. Um, and, you know, there are ways of doing that, um, but always trying to get better and better resolution on it. For instance, there have been people who have looked at small sections of dog brains where they look at like, you know, um, a thousand cells, not in an organoid, but in a section of a brain, and try to just, rather than, they're just going to detect the signals they get from those particular, that particular subset of cells in response to showing the dog a bone or something like that, or food or something. What happens, as Matt said, and can you see that those same cells, those same kinds of electrical activities happening no matter how many times you do that. And then you can start learning how those uh, neurons interact with each other. There are some practical applications of this coming down the road, maybe. People are looking at ways, for instance, with people who have lost the ability to speak, you know, can you figure out what their thoughts are and translate that through some artificial interface into giving them the ability to speak or take an action. And uh, these things are called imagined speech. It almost sounds like science fiction. And it's sort of in its early stages, but this is real research where they're trying to get enough resolution on those different uh, areas of the brain that light up so that they can match those by following, for example, the difference in uh, subtle changes in the musculature of your face when you're speaking. So these people might be able to move their face, move their jaw and so forth, almost like reading lips, but also reading all the other muscles and the way the eyes move and so forth. And somehow collecting all that information and changing it into speech. If I can give one more example, there are yeah. efforts also being made to be able to communicate between the brain and a severed limb, for example, where there's a prosthesis in place so that movements by 
the brain telling other muscles to move, those being picked up, and that information then being used to inform the uh, motors in a prosthesis. So, uh, but once again, it all depends on being able to collect enough information about the different areas of the brain and how they work. Because as you can imagine, this is, you know, to figure out what a small child has a thousand words. Mm -hmm. We probably have 20,000 or 30,000 or something. To get that kind of resolution would be very, very difficult. Right. Daryl, I'm interested in this interface you're talking about. Is this uh, an algorithm or is it physical or is it chemical chemical, or a combination of all three or anything else? Uh, different ones are different. Uh, the one, one I just was reading about recently was at Michigan and they had taken, this is for to power a prosthesis and they had attached a small bit of muscle tissue to the end of the severed nerve. So then now you've got that connection between the nerve and the muscle back, at least a small piece of, mu of muscle tissue. The brain can then be taught to fire that muscle. And then the information from that firing of the muscle can be picked up by sensors in the prosthetic arm that tell the arm to move in different ways. So in that sense, it's sort of a tissue sort of thing. Other ones are looking at the, uh, almost like having a camera in front of your face to try to pick up the movements of your face and so forth. Very difficult because changes in lighting, as you can see on my face as I move, at uh, different camera angles, it's awkward. Mm -hmm. um, others are trying to look at, uh, um, at more of the art, the electrical movements. They put um, electric, like a, an, an electroencephalograph where you mm -hmm. put sensors all around the head and then try to pick up enough of those different areas of the brain, you know, to teach them to be able to then use that. That could be picked up by other sensors and mm -hmm. go into okay. some sort of an artificial voice box. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. But before we leave, I, uh, I want you to you, Matthew, first, and then Gary, second. We talked about where we're at right now and what we're developing in the near, in the near future. Uh, just let your imaginations run a little wild, and can you, <laughs> can you can you tell us where you think and what we're going to be able to do maybe in the next twenty five years or so. Um, well, I, as I as I said, I, I think these organoids are going to be a, such an incredibly useful tool down the line to understand how how the cells, the different neurons um, and the glial cells, uh, communicate with one another in order to pro sort of process thoughts. Um, the one um, caveat I have is is that um, you won't. I don't think you'll be able to ever build um, a physical, a biological model of a of an actual working brain. Um, because everybody's brain is different from each other. You learn different things differently. You have different experiences. Your senses are, you know, maybe some senses, some of your senses are more heightened and, and more aware than others. And so your 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 the, the, the memories and your experiences end up in as as a, as a particular structure in the brain which is unique to you. So I don't mm. think we can copy that, but we can build this artificial intelligence which is now being um, developed. Um, they use a process called machine learning in which the, the computer program is essentially um, given repeatedly different scenarios and essentially then tries to d perceive a pattern and that's, of course, what our own brain is doing. Our brains are very, very good at pattern recognition. And I think pattern recognition is all part of having a, a, a certain high level of intellectual intellectual, um, intellectual um, abilities. Uh, just think of an octopus, for example. Right. So it's oh, pattern yes. recognition for a, for a machine to learn a pattern and then be able to then perhaps predict, given a, a few smaller circumstances, and uh, uh, to determine how that pattern is going to end up. And this, I think, was part of your original idea, um, um, Bernie, um, about sort of where the future can be going. Um, right. Gary? 
Yeah, I, I would look to a more uh, maybe practical end of this in a sense, rather than the science fiction one. And that is that I think that an awful lot is being learned at certainly at the cell and molecular level. And I think that, you know, I think that bodes well for diseases like Alzheimer's and stroke and spinal cord injuries. I think that those things are, you know, because we know as much as we know right now and the the work in the labs is almost like science fiction, a lot of it. And I think those diseases, you know, for example, I have great faith that it may be too late, Bernie, for you and me and Matt in terms of Alzheimer's disease. But I think that for our children, there's it's quite likely that uh, our children may not have to worry about those so much. Because right. I think Well, I think on that positive note, we need to conclude uh, it's important for us to look forward to something good. So <laughs> thank you thank you so much for coming on today and talking about this. I hope to have you back on again soon. Um, and we will certainly get together and talk about uh, what we want to cover next time. Thank you very much and have a good weekend, everybody. We're looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>